Hello, I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom, with our host, the Reverend Joseph Hinchy and Lisa Fertini Campbell. Now here's Lisa. Praise be Jesus Christ. Now and forever. Welcome everyone once again to the series Duke and Altum with the Reverend Joseph Henchy of the Congregation of the Sacred Stigmata. Hello, Father. Hello, Lisa, and really this is the day the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. Alleluia. Well, as those of you who have been listening to us for quite some uh, number of episodes now know, we are following the great St. Peter out into the depths of our Catholic spirituality. And in these last many episodes, Father's been giving us some instruction and ability to reflect on the redemptive mystery and the agony of Gethsemane. But I understand, Father, before you begin, there's something you'd like to tell us all. Yes, there is. I have made a kind of a serious mistake or blunder or what's happened is I was relying on my own local memory. We are trying to present the comparison of Mark, Matthew and Luke in the Garden of Gethsemane and I tried to do this by local memory if that's the right word where the, where Satan appears and where the angel appears in Mark, Matthew and Luke. So I made a mistake in the last few lectures saying that in Luke there was no angel in Gethsemane. But there is, as the image of the box would show, I repeatedly said that he would go back to the corner and be spruced up by his handlers. And some found in that a kind of a uh, hint that maybe this is just a manipulator or managed. How could he be helped from heaven and then the trial get worse? He was helped by heaven to pray more earnestly. So the emphasis here is the insistent prayer, as we'll see. Anyway, I made a little bit of a schema or a little bit of an outline here regarding the appearance of angels and Satan. First of all, in the temptation scene, Mark has Satan, but no angel. Matthew has Satan, but speaks in general, you will be assisted by the angels. And Luke has Satan in his desert temptation and the same generic, you will be helped by the angels. But in Gethsemane, no one has the angel except Luke. Mm. So there's no mention of an angel in Mark or Matthew, but it appears in Luke. So what we're going to try to do today is to bring these four opinions of the sweat of blood to a conclusion and then finish up this commentary of Gethsemane according to Luke, and then offer a few spiritual corollaries like the spirituality of martyrdom and the theology of prayer that we learn from this wonderful mystery of the Son of Man dying for each and every one of us. Well, thank you, Father, and my goodness gracious, I think it's very hard to keep in, as you say, your local memory, um, all all of the dimensions of Scripture. So thanks for uh, correcting that for all of us. There are angels in Luke, and they are ministering and helping uh, Christ through all of this. And this little episode helped me to remember an old corny joke when the Anglican vicar went to Lady Jackson looking for a few extra pounds to fix the vicarage roof which was damaged. So he tried to introduce it. They were about contemporaries. So he says, you know, Lady Jackson, you and I are of a certain age now and we should begin to prepare for the hereafter. So Lady Jackson looks at him by vicar. Every time I come downstairs, I say, what did I come down hereafter? So this is where memory is at a certain time. At a certain age. So you've had a senior moment, I guess we call it. I've had a senior decade. Uh, I guess. Well, like I say to my students, Father, Mm. if this is the worst thing you ever did all day, it's not so bad indeed. So I think we can can all uh, enjoy the correction Mm. and be more clear. And perhaps... You have even driven people back to the Bible to double-check your facts, which isn't such a bad thing. That would be the real reason. So why don't you begin us with a prayer, and then we'll go back to this uh, reflection. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
Mary, seed of wisdom, pray for us. And Saint Peter, please pray for us all. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So we'll try to draw to a conclusion here a few more paragraphs on the position of Father uh, Feulet, whom I have followed for the most part in this presentation of the sweating of blood and this whole mystery of Gethsemane. It's interesting, many folks would hold, as I would myself, the New Testament really has only one mystery, Jesus Christ. But there are so many aspects of it, and we are blinded by this bright light of revelation. We need to break it into parts and look at his, uh, his earthly life, his passion, death, resurrection, and ascension, and then the Eucharist and sacraments, and that he, by his whole life, redeemed uh, every aspect of our life. So we look then uh, the great father Suarez, a, a Jesuit theologian, knowing that in the Ignatian system there was the spiritual exercises and they would spend many days contemplating the mysteries of Christ. So father Suarez provided an excellent commentary on these. So we'll look here now, uh, concluding uh, Father Feuillet's opinion. He says, The details of the agony in Gethsemane are intimately associated with what has preceded in Luke's account. It seems that he gave a little more emphasis to connecting this with what went before. As we remember, it's a very unusual thing. As usual, they had their little supper, and as was their wont, they made their way out into the garden singing psalms. And then all of a sudden, Jesus goes off, taking with him three of his apostles, and falls flat on his face in deep prayer. And then, of course, the arrest happens and we go on to the passion. So it seems that Luke is very connected with what has preceded. For example, there are several real connections between Gethsemane and the earlier chapters in Luke. For example, Luke 4, 13. Jesus' struggle against Satan at the beginning of his public life is chapter 4, 1 to 13, and particularly in the closing ominous line found in Luke 4, 13. The devil left him to come back at the appointed time. Well, this is the appointed time. And secondly, the immediately preceding context in which Jesus describes a time of crisis in Luke 22, 35 to 38. And finally, this Luke 37, 22, 37. I tell you, these words of scripture have to be fulfilled in me. He let himself be taken for a criminal. So these now can open up for us a few little reflections here. First of all, the temptations in the desert. We've done this through the three evangelists at the three synoptics. The temptations in the desert is that time between Jesus in the desert and Gethsemane. Well, this calls to mind the temptation of Adam and Eve, the first Adam, their expulsion from the garden into a desert. But between the baptism of Jesus and his going out into the desert. There's his genealogy in chapter 3, Luke chapter 3, 23 to 28. And Jesus comes out of this genealogy as the new Adam, who will triumph and correct the failure of the first Adam. So that's another little link here. Mm -hmm. And secondly, as we've seen so many times, along with the Son of Man and the new Adam, Jesus is the suffering servant of Isaiah 53, 12. So just before the scene of Gethsemane, Jesus is speaking of a decisive battle. If you have no sword, sell your cloak and buy one. This seems almost contradictory to what he'll say. But the reason is, it's kind of by contrast, that, that the battle is coming. And the immediately following is where Jesus quotes a servant passage about being taken for a criminal. So Jesus quotes the old prophecy of Isaiah to identify himself as Gethsemane gets underway. So along with being connected with what precedes, Luke really has a connection with what follows Luke's gospel. In Matthew and Mark, the concluding words of Jesus are telling the disciples, sleep on, and this is in some contrast with what Luke says, has as Jesus' last words to them. Why are you asleep? Get up. And pray not to be put to the test. Mm -hmm. This is a major emphasis, and it gives a certain coloring to the entire Lucan presentation of Gethsemane. It's a great lesson, 
as the intensity, the darkness, the temptation, the trials, the grief, the anger, as these increase, let us always meet them with intensifying prayer. Well, and that is the idea, isn't it, of, of all of the Christian life. We, mm-hmm. we can't mm-hmm. control much of what happens to us. Some things, mm-hmm. yes, but much of what happens mm-hmm. to us is completely beyond our control. Mm-hmm. But we can hold on to prayer mm-hmm. throughout the whole mm-hmm. thing so that we encounter all of life with gracefulness and mm-hmm. dignity and courage and... Mm-hmm peace of heart mm. and mind. Is that right? This is exactly right. And I think the contrast here is that Jesus did this without anyone. We never have to do this without Jesus. That's right. I will be with you all days, even to the consummation of your life, your world. So <clears throat> this indicates that in in Jesus' mind for Luke, Gethsemane is not a complete unit. It's a summary of what preceded and an introduction as the beginning of the frightful ordeal. Throughout this entire terrible matter, the disciples are being called upon to keep from sleeping, to watch and to pray ever more intensely. So throughout the four Gospels, there are reminiscences of the Our Father, as we've seen in the words pronounced by Jesus at the time of his passion. So that would be a good prayer to use in times of real difficulty. Deliver me from evil, lead us not into temptation, and so on. So this is but to be expected, the central prayer in the life of Jesus. His prayer word would be Abba, you know, in centering prayer. You try to find a prayer word. Well, I think maybe St. Paul would have had Kyrios, and maybe St. Ignatius would have had Sushipe, Mm -hmm. Receive, O Lord, all my freedom, his his act of abandonment. Well, if we could apply this to Jesus, it seems that his great prayer word is Abba. It opens up an entire relationship which will then be much developed by St. John's Gospel. So God is our Abba in the hour that has come for all of us. These are the final times. And Luke in particular in chapter 11, verse 1, when one of the disciples saw Jesus himself praying, he his request was forthcoming. And this is the way the text reads in chapter 11. Now once Jesus was in a certain place praying, and when he had finished, one of his disciples said, Lord, teach us how to pray, as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, say this when you pray, Our Father, may your name be holy. Mm. So you can see that Luke was just in totally concerned or totally absorbed in the prayer of Jesus Christ. In Matthew, the recollections of the Our Father are concentrated in the agony account. But Luke refers to the Our Father by quoting verbatim one of the petitions of the Our Father, let your will be done, not mine, in Luke 22. However, before and then after the agony, there are two veiled references to the Lord's Prayer, perhaps a further indication for Luke and he means to offer this as a connecting link through Gethsemane to the Passion and Death. We read, for example, in 11, Luke eleven four, Your kingdom come. And then Luke 22, I shall not drink until the kingdom does come. Or Luke eleven four, Forgive us our sins. Father, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. How can we summarize this tremendously detailed uh, episode in the life of Christ. This, into this summary of the the entire gospel, and this immediate introduction or preface to the to the uh, passion and death. So the blood mentioned by Luke in Gethsemane twenty two forty four, is a reference to the redemptive blood of Jesus Christ. This is a preparation for the flow, the total flow of His blood, by bleeding to death on the cross through his sacred stigmata. There is an implicit inference, a reference here to the blood of the cup, the new covenant of the mercy of God, the Eucharist, as an anticipation of Calvary. So from now on, a memorial in which the mystery is represented, this is the Eucharist. The disciples of all time prepare for their ordeal by receiving the strength of victory of Christ in and through the Eucharist. So this then brings us to the 
conclusion, or, or at least maybe the beginning of a deeper insight in your own hearts and minds into the nature of the sweating of blood. The majority of modern opinion seems to be that it was a metaphor. But many, many solid scholars, as well as many of the early texts, say these verses were there. And the, the, the language used in them, which is Luke's style here, using hapaklagomina, words only found here. So since I forgot the angel in Luke, uh, there is a little reflection here on the Father's will and the appearance of the angel. In, in Luke 22, verse 42, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, let your will be done and not, me, not mine. Then an angel appeared to him, coming from heaven to give him strength. Not, not to that he, he applies to heaven and the suffering gets worse. He needed strength for prayer, That's right. as we do. So I don't see any real conflict here uh, between this, this handle of the angel or whoever, this help from heaven. And this is the only mention. Uh, Luke does mention the angel in the uh, creation scene and also at the end in the resurrection, but not in Gethsemane. So we've already noted that Luke could very well have had recourse to the Old Testament spirituality of martyrdom. The, the acts of martyrs can help us shed some light into the mystery of Gethsemane. So in the record of these acts of the martyrs, in addition to the state of agony in which they found themselves, these Old Testament heroes and heroines or these early church heroes and heroines faced a terrible situation and fear as the ordeal came to them in Second Maccabees 3 and 15. There's many, many references here. So even though the word agonia is not used as Judas 4.2, she was trembling going in to see the king. Or First Maccabees chapter 11, there is clearly brought out the incapacity of those who find themselves in such anguish or such sadness or such anger or such frustration mm -hmm. or such guilt, yes. whatever it is. And the terrible ordeal is simply God's way of calling them through the struggles by teaching a more intense prayer. So the terrible ordeal descending over them, the martyrs of all realized that they could never undertake or overcome their trial unaided. Characteristically, all of these martyrs are presented as being in a pose of prayer. A particular beauty, I think, are those teenage girl martyrs like Agatha and Lucy and Cecilia and their dialogue of great smartness. <laughs> now I know that this was not a press conference they were having, but the way they understood martyrdom in the early church, these innocent, beautiful young girls offering their lives to God in the fervor of their faith. So <clears throat> they are found using expressions that indicate that their prayer was insistent too, as we read in Judith 4.2, with acids, ashes on their heads, they stretched out their hands before the Lord. This is the Jews preparing that there be, that it was Holofernes about to invade. So they they stretched out their hands before the Lord, looking at Holofernes' big army down in the valley. They firmly joined together, begging God not to let their little ones be massacred. Or again, Second Maccabees 11. And then the populace begged the Lord with lamentation and tears, to send them a good angel to save Israel. And in Maccabees, there's a few times of these mysterious horses, horsemen riding to the defense of the people of God seem angelic or at least spiritual. So a number of these texts do not limit themselves to speaking about insistent prayer, but also they bring in the object of their requests that our little ones not be massacred. A further characteristic of all of this, of course, is the Lord infallibly hears the prayer of his little ones, of his faithful ones, especially when they undergo terrible duress. There is the presence of an angel. This is one of those mysterious texts from Second Maccabees 2. Before their eyes, a horse richly decorated and carrying a fearsome rider, rearing violently, it struck the enemy. Second Maccabees uh, 
10.29 When the battle was at its height, the enemy saw five magnificent men appear from heaven on horses with golden bridles and put themselves at the head of the Jews. Hmm. What are these visitations? Second Maccabees 11.8 They were still near Jerusalem when a rider appeared in white apparel and at the head brandishing golden accoutrements. Hmm. Well, this is really maybe a vision of, of a Halloween night or a time of terrible fear and these, ex- these extraordinary figures appear but at least it's some kind of assistance that Israel had not trained in their own boot camp. Well, it, it sounds, in the, the way it can be read, to a modern ear it can sound like Lord of the Rings or mm, something, mm, something. Mm. but that notion that there is rescue mm. when you pray. Mm-hmm. And it may not appear as a rider with a golden bridle, mm-hmm. but it, it hopefully appears as a way of letting go. Mm. Mm-hmm. You know, when when you were talking about people being so caught up in anger or guilt or fear or distress, it made me think about all the, the years that um, I was more athletic in my life than I am now. And and my weightlifting coach would always say when, when you're lifting, don't hold your breath, breathe. And I think that that if I could make the analogy, feeling in the grip of despair, frustration, mm-hmm. anger, grief, it guilt, it is, it's like holding your breath. Mm-hmm. And prayer is like breathing. Mm-hmm. And if you breathe, you can handle the exertion mm-hmm. better. Mm-hmm. And, and so that is, that's what I think mm-hmm. Luke is constantly mm-hmm. urging mm-hmm. us to is, Mm-hmm. Greater prayer because this we can let go of all of that mm-hmm. stuff, hand it over mm-hmm. to God, mm-hmm. make ourselves part of the stream of that. That's a very interesting and beautiful image, as you know, it was used by Pope St. John Paul II in his Lumen Orientale, that we of the Latin Church need the spirituality of the Eastern Church. And he said to live the life of faith you have to breathe through both lungs. Uh So this sense of integrity and so on. And secondly, after all this darkness of Gethsemane and so on, and we'll follow this with a few reflections on the descent of Christ on Holy Saturday. It's a bit of a mystery, but it's all St. Peter's fault. He has the text, he alone has the text that is used to be quoted or still is by some that we'll see on the descent of Christ. But Gethsemane then is very much like the Transfiguration, which I hope to finish on. Gethsemane is a summary of what went before and a promise of what's happening or a a proleptic account of what's going to take place. The Transfiguration happened on the way to Calvary. And in Luke's Jesus, his face was fixed on Jerusalem. And it is a kind of a preview of coming attractions in the resurrection. So we will look at all of these things and end probably on this many ref- on many reflections on the transfiguration, even though that preceded Gethsemane, it also uh, <clears throat> preceded the resurrection. So we'll end on Peter also with his very unique account of the transfiguration. We'll end with that. But let's now... Uh, wrap up this thing on Lucan's uh, the Lucan idea of uh, of Gethsemane. So, with all of this wonder, there remains a profound conviction that all of this is unfolding according to the will of God. It is noteworthy that these elements of the spirituality of martyrdom are all found in Luke's as Gethsemane account. There is a power from on high. There is darkness, a forbidding enemy. Jesus, who is in agonia, finds himself in deep need of divine assistance, and he wills that the Father's plan be fulfilled. So his regret over the apostles' lack of attention do not seem only because they did not comfort him, but primarily they did not do their basic job as a come, follow me, and, and keep awake and, and pray. Uh, watch and pray. So in response to the prayer, he is strengthened for further prayer, 
not that his allevi- his his agony, personal agony, would be alleviated. And of course, there is the father's comfort. So let's look here at this father's will. <laughs> It is the most mysterious uh, reality, it seems to me, in this whole mystery of Jesus Christ. These texts that depict the spirituality of martyrdom, either for the group, the church, or for individuals, are some indication of the divine will, as we see in Judith 8.27, 2 Maccabees 6. Philo used the symbolism of the stadium when he wrote that God is preparing the world as his arena, it is God himself who calls out the names of the contestants, the martyrs, for whom he has prepared the victor's cup. In apocryphal works, those that are not under divine revelation, but sometimes are included with the biblical accounts, in apocryphal works, this symbolism is not rare. The contest in this worldwide arena will be, will be won by those who are faithful. The martyr's crown is to be in accord with the Father's will. There is never a prayer that this mysterious, this mysterious will be will be accomplished for sure. But in prayers, we're asking for help, all the help necessary to overcome the trial that would keep us from keeping the will of God. So Luke's Gethsemane scene, there is a specific prayer on the part of Jesus Christ. He prays that the divine will be accomplished and perhaps implicitly this should be seen here, he is asking God for the necessary assistance in his human nature to overcome this ordeal, that the divine will really will be fulfilled. Then a few concluding thoughts on the comfort from the angel. Like in the treatment of the other synoptics, there is a kind of a doctrinal conclusion or summary, and this is what I'm doing here, uh, looking at what these extraordinary texts tell us of what they seem to be linked toward. So the comfort from the angel is divine comfort that comes from on high. This is much more abundant in the spirituality of martyrdom. These texts emphasize much more the victory of one who struggles for the Lord. The victory of the people is possible only with the strength and power coming from God himself, whereas Gethsemane seems much more interested in the will of God, in the intense prayer that we can offer. For example, in Second Maccabees three fourteen to 26 in this terrible anguish which the priests and people find themselves, a night appears in response to their prayer. Second Maccabees 10, there's a great supplication addressed to heaven and response comes in the form of five wars. Of course, once you say five, some of the fathers would see here the segment of the five wounds. Second Maccabees 11. This is the supplication of the pious soldiers for a good angel for the salvation of all the people. With the appearance of the good angel, the people praise God and find courage. Second Maccabees 15. The Lord is reminded of the time. O Lord, do not forget me. In the times of Hezekiah, the Jews were able to rejoice heartily at the manifestation of divine assistance. So this early Judaic literature could never be used as probative texts. They don't prove, but they do indicate something. Mm-hmm. They do mm-hmm. seem to indicate uh, a, a principle. This seems to be a, an aspect of apocalyptic literature, symbolism, and uh, very uh, symbolic uh, language. There are other texts of early Judaic literature in which the victory is presented as coming only through divine assistance, whether or not <clears throat> there was the insistence on prayer uh, of the faithful servants of God. So the agony scene of Luke is inspired by this spiritual of martyrdom from Maccabees. That's why it's a very important book, and I'll give at the uh, when I get into the, the corollary of the spirituality of martyrdom, a, a very interesting recent uh, authors who are studying the spirituality of Maccabees. Uh, <clears throat> the agony seems to be inspired by this. The spirit that pervades the ordeal of Jesus is the ultimate victory. Jesus' prayer is, your will be done. And this seems to be much in accord with Matthew twenty-six forty-two, 
the divine will can do all things. So Jesus is the one who shows the paradigm, the model, the exemplary cause. And the exemplary cause in me has always been a very interesting domination or contribution of St. Thomas Aquinas, which of course he gets in the Greek philosophy. But a model is like a statue or a painting that seems lifeless sometimes. But an exemplary cause the stigma of Jesus, for example, provide us the opportunity to explain this. Four of the wounds were redemptive by satisfaction. By that I mean by merit. But the fifth wound violated a dead body. Right. So that could not be uh, by meritorious or by satisfaction. The satisfaction was over. So St. Thomas says that the, the efficient cause here is one of exemplarity or in Peter's idea that Jesus is the risen cornerstone with new life. And all of us stones building up the temple of God would be simply uh, trying to get as close as, as we can to this living cornerstone. And that is, come follow me, get behind me and follow me. So <clears throat> this, this paradigm or this example or this exemplar, exemplary cause prays with even greater intensity. The prayer is heard and he is strengthened and this is a new strength that he offers us by watching and praying not to be put to the test, which I'll now explain a little bit. This is Luke 22, verses 45 and following. Pray not to be put to the test. So there's very good evidence here that of many commentators of Luke 22 that this is all from the spirit of martyrdom of the Maccabees and from other extra-biblical literature. There is clear contrast with some Stoic writings which never mention recourse to prayer. It might at least be said that these martyrdom writings in some way prepared for Luke's composition of his gospel. These people were scared to death in the Old Testament. Sure. And they asked for help, and the help came in rather outlandish or extraordinary format. With a format. So Luke presents Jesus confronting this terrible Greek word. I think the Greek word is slipsis. And we read in, uh, in Apocalypse that the seven churches and the readings help us to overcome the slipsis of life, the ordeal of life. Take up your cross every day and follow me. So Jesus confronts his difficult text, test according to Luke. And his attitude is one of model reaction and preparation for this ultimate ordeal with the powers of darkness. This is what leads to final victory for us all. Some of the earlier texts would be like the Testament of Job, the martyrdom of Isaiah. These are not uh, scriptural or revealed texts, but apocryphal. The Hebrew words in these compositions are very similar to the Greek of Luke 22. The dynamis, the dynamite or the power coming from the angel is in his agonia. There are other texts that have this. For example, Isaiah 41, verses 9 and following. You are my servant. I have chosen you, not rejected you. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. Stop being anxious and watch, for I am your God. I will give you strength. I bring you help. I uphold you with my victorious right hand. A threefold promise yes. of the presence of God. And this is a very powerful text. I have not rejected you. It seems it. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Do not be afraid. This is what is said all over, even to Mary. Do not be afraid, for you have found favor with God. Mm -hmm. So whatever Christ has assumed, he has redeemed. So whatever any of our fears might be, they have been redeemed by by Jesus Himself. Well, it's like that that Psalm response. Uh, it's probably my favorite one. Rescue me, O Lord, beyond my wants, beyond my fears, from death into life. It kind of summarizes it really everything. Does. Everything it really does. And these, of course, that's why these very pithy things come to us and stick to us because they do summarize so much of what we believe is the truth. So the Lord becomes fortified by powers for heaven for a more intense, intense prayer. There's an instance in Deuteronomy 3.28 where Moses fortifies Joshua 
in, a, in accord with the command of God. Moses was going back to God, and Joshua is going to take over, and he's scared to death. Mm -hmm. So he is given courage with the same spirit that motivated Moses. So all of these texts were distant preparations for the deeper understanding of the ordeal or the test of life. Is it possible to summarize all these things? And of course, of course it is not. But anyway, just to summarize this little aspect. It can be concluded that the background for the Gethsemane of Luke is indeed a spirituality of martyrdom based primarily on Maccabees and extra-biblical Judaic parallels. Jesus' attitude in Gethsemane is not some passive acceptance of a terrible ordeal that I can't do anything about it anyway. His is an active response, seeking fulfillment of the Father's will by more intense prayer. Jesus is presented as cautious, consciously, knowingly, entering into this terrible spiritual combat. There are present, of course, profound sentiments in this humanity of apprehension and anguish or terms that help us, metaphors, whatever they may be, of the depths and the seriousness of this ordeal. But there is a sense of eminent preparation on the part of Jesus. He's ready for this. They will, the gates of darkness will not prevail. And in this particularly challenging moment of the church, we must remember that. The gates of darkness, the powers of hell, will not prevail. So Jesus uses the means that are infallible for every Christian in his or her terrible anguish, flipsies. The infallible means a prayer in the place of conflict, in the face of conflict. The prayer intensifies as the comfort is brought and as the ordeal increases. The prayer expresses profound adherence to God's will and a constant implicit request for God's help. So the appearance of the angel and the bestowing of strength not only emphasize the hearing of the prayer, but they also imply the certainty of anyone's prayer in harmony with that of Jesus of Gethsemane. Not my will be done, but thine. Watch and pray that I do not fail the test. So with this style of expression, Luke has achieved a number of dog dogmatic purposes. First of all, Anguish, which is found in 1433, is presented with the added nuance of real struggle. You don't lay down on the train tracks. You try to undo the bonds that are holding you there. The paranesis, or the encouragement, like we see that in the Acts of the Apostles. Barnabas was a good man because he was full of the Holy Spirit. And with Paul, he went around to the early church to encourage them. Well, that's paranesis <coughs> for all Christians that teach his disciples to find comfort in their own temptations and trials. And it's all based on the example of Jesus Christ and his response to the ordeal. We are one with him in baptism. So the athletic symbolism also found in classical Greek, describing the Olympic, sacred Olympic Games or the arena, they're all taken up in Greek Judaic circles to describe the great athletes of God, all of those struggling for virtue. These beautiful lines are found in Professor Galizzi in his Jesu nel Gethsemane, we, whom we considered before. This leads us then, believe it or not, <laughs> to the final summary that we can find or make use of in uh, Luke's, by looking, Luke's Gospel by going over the verses a little bit in detail. There's probably five or six pages here, so this should not take too long. Anyway, let's leap in go out into the deep. From the structure then of the passage concerning the agony in Gethsemane, prayer is predominant. It's what predominates. And overall reflection would see that this much emphasis given to the agonia, the test, the trial, but these are all met and conquered by ever intense prayer. So in the spirituality, as we now seen, and hopefully is very clear in our minds and hearts and for our continuing prayer, it seems that the evangelist is presenting Jesus undergoing a very difficult encounter. We all do this later in life when we go to the doctor or when loved ones die or we just can't do anymore what we used to do so easily. We forget and we don't see well, we 
forget our canes and our hearing aids and even our false teeth sometimes. So the evangelist is showing Jesus in this encounter and reminding us we will face it too. I tell you, watch and pray that you do not enter into temptation. This is present not only from the language used, but this whole scene, this whole example of the intense prayer of Jesus grappling with God's will. For those familiar with the Judaic tradition to adhere to God and to his law, to do this, we need prayer. And with this is a pledge of victory, Second Maccabees 18. As the first light began to spread, remember Psalm 130, the dark mm-hmm. one, the mm-hmm. night watchman looks for the stir streaks of dawn. The two sides joined in battle, one having as their pledge of success and victory not only their own valor, but their recourse to the Lord, while the other tried to make of their own courage their, their mainstay in the, in the fight. So Luke seems to have had in mind the descriptions of the glory of Christ from chapter 24, verses 26 and 46. Was it not ordained that this Christ should suffer and so enter into his glory? So you see how it is written that Christ would suffer and on the third day would rise from the dead and that in his name repentance for the forgiveness of sins would be preached to all nations beginning with Jerusalem. So... <clears throat> Hebrews, of course, 12, he was, seemed to refer to this. Let us not lose sight of Jesus who leads us in our faith. Think of the way he stood up to opposition from sinners and then you will never give up a want of courage in the fight against sin. So Luke presents Jesus as a martyr, as a faithful witness. Uh, this insight helps us in the concept of tribulation and trial this awful battle with the powers of darkness. So in addition to the formal agonia, other factors are present here. The healing of the high priest's servant in the middle of this in Luke 22. Jesus converting look toward Peter, asking Peter to reform after weeping brittily. For, but after <clears throat> Jesus looked upon Jesus, Peter, who then went out and wept bit, bitterly. So there were many parallels, the prayer of Jesus for his enemies, the dialogue between the good thief and Jesus. All of this during this drama, these are little sideshows. But this day you will be with me in paradise. So these are the elements of a martyr. The book of Apocalypse describes Jesus in these terms. He is the message. He is the message of the Amen. What does that mean? When we say Amen after Holy Communion, we're saying, let this Eucharist that the passion, death, resurrection, and ascension be accomplished in me. This is the message of the Amen, the faithful, the true witness, the ultimate course of God's creation. So scholars have individuated characteristics which can be considered as proper to a martyr. First of all, a fierce combat. This isn't a toothache. Or this isn't a loss of sleep. In all conflict, martyrs hope for the help of God. This is the classical attitude of a martyr, the appearance of a heavenly being. Political motives are sometimes the outward reason for martyrdom. The martyr promises to others the reward of life, the innocence of the martyr. The reward is the resurrection, and on and on we go. The modern scholarship has compared these elements with the characteristics that distinguish the passion of Luke according to both Matthew, Matthew and Mark, the very clear presence of Satan here, strength is obtained through prayer, the appearance of the heavenly being, and so on. With an abundance of data and cross-references, one can read between the lines here and see Luke's intention. In the less we find Judaic martyr stories, there are invectives hurled against the persecutors. They curse them like Jeremiah. Yeah. May the heads of the, my enemy's children be dashed against. That's hideous mm-hmm. because of his imperfect imperfection. Same with David. What would you do with a man that stole the... I'd cut his head off. You are the man. So <clears throat> there is great comparison between the Old Testament martyr stories, of course, and the passion of Jesus and a few other characteristics found outside of the Gethsemane account. This is much more emphasized in Luke than Matthew. These are more or less nuances or, uh, or uh, 
particulars that we might not really see well, and so I won't spend much time on those. So in Luke's account, more than in those of Matthew and Mark, the innocence of Jesus is emphasized. I think in the gospel-orientated uh, Matthew, the, the, the ecclesial gospel, it's more the power of Jesus, the example of Jesus. But here is the innocence. Over and over again we find this. In Luke 23, I find no cause in this man. That's Luke 4, Luke 14. I found no case against this man. Verse 15, nor has Herod either. And verse 22, I have found no case against him that deserves death. All of this is lacking in the other accounts. There's also a slight shift of emphasis in the profession of faith of the centurion. Jesus is confessed as the Son of God. But in Luke we read, in the other Gospels, truly you are the Son of God. When the centurion saw what had taken place, he gave praise to God and said, this is a great and good man. And the people who had gathered for the spectacle saw what happened, and they went home beating their breasts, a yes. sign of repentance yes. and conversion. So it's remarkable, these little shifts of, of insight, or adding, helping us to understand the mystery, the, the terms of the mystery. So these traits have been inspired by the idea that the martyr will conquer all adversaries. The ninth trait of the martyr is the reward found in Luke 24, 26, and 46. Was it not ordained that Christ should suffer and so enter into his glory? So you see how it is written that Christ would suffer, but on the third day would rise again from the dead. So Luke, therefore, has his own style in the presentation of this story. The spirituality of the martyrs inaugurated with the books of Maccabees has made much impact on Luke. The literature of the martyrs is often presented in the style of a real struggle and ordeal. And this is what has impressed Luke in his handling of these materials. So to conclude this little reflection of Luke, I'd like to offer a few uh, possible notes of bibliography. We have two books of Maccabees in the uh, uh, canon of the Old Testament. But there's a fourth book of Maccabees put out by Sheffield Press of 1998. And the editor is at David De Silva. And this is very worthwhile reading to see the development of this spirituality theme. Secondly, a Professor S.A. Cummins, C-U-M-M-I-N-S, Paul and the Crucified Jesus, Crucified Christ in Antioch, in the Antioch Maccabean tradition, and again in Galatians 1 and 2. Shemuel Shepkaru, S E H P K A R U, Jewish Martyrs in the Pagan and Christian Worlds, put out by Cambridge in 2010. The Dutch scholar Jan Willem van Henten, H E N T E N, the Maccabean martyrs as saviors of the Jewish people. This is a study of 24-4 and following. Wiesel, Eli Wiesel and his night, the night everything died, counts the religion and faith. Then Jarvis Williams, Maccabean martyr traditions in Paul's theology of atonement. This is found by a reprint found in 2010 by Whipf and Stock of Eugene, Oregon. So the final lesson, if we could say that, of Luke for us, and really what seems to be Luke's central lessons, central message, is prayer as a major theme. The Our Father lived. So when Jesus, when they asked Jesus, and can imagine the apostles who said, Lord, we believe, help our unbelief. Or when they say, Jesus, teach us how to pray, because the sign of every group was the capacity and how they prayed. So when he told them, he gave the Lord's Prayer, which St. Thomas says is a perfect prayer, not only because of its author, but also because it's a theology of prayer, what's needed. We pray everything, thy will be done. That's why we have not downplayed novenas and tridua, but we want to be very careful always that no superstition gets into that. If you do the five first Fridays and uh, five for Saturdays, 
of the Nine First Fridays, uh, Father Karl Rana ra rather uh, content contentiously has kind of, uh, he tried, as he said in his critique of the Sacred Heart devotion, was to improve it or to eliminate the, the, the uh, sentimentality from it, like good night, sweet Jesus, and so on, which needed to be done most likely, but some feel he might have thrown the baby away with the water because he begins then a rather intense scrutiny of St. Margaret Mary and so on and on and on. Anyway, so prayer is a major theme. The matter that we're dealing with here is the long-awaited Messiah, waited through all the ages. This martyrdom was the only, or at least the overriding purpose of Luke's rendition of this mystery. It would seem the unfolding events, though, was a little bit different because it's not only martyrdom. The emphasis is prayer. The state of agony when the martyrs are confronted with evil is a real struggle, and it's met by their prayer. The reaction of the one subjected to this ordeal is concretized in prayer. This is what he does. I, I can't handle this law. Or lastly, the prayer is heard by heaven, and that's the promise. So some of the fathers shifted the verse here. They had the company angel come after the sweating of the blood. Well, this is understandable in that the classical idea of the handlers in a boxing match or help from heaven would then not normally be followed by even greater agony. The shift though it would present the whole scene more clearly as one of martyrdom and the prayer of the martyr. He prayed more intensely. So it's most probable to look at this phrase, phase of the Passion, as a lesson in prayer. No matter what happens, watch and pray, and as the agony increases, pray more intensely. Therefore, again, the Gethsemane scene for Luke has this modeled lesson or prayer. In other words, he shows us how to do it. Mm -hmm. And then if we go by the causa exemplaris, he helps us how to do it. Yes. They used to tell us that uh, the difference between a sign and a sacrament might be described in this silly little story. There's a man going down the highway of life with a very heavy load on his shoulders, his cross. And there's a sign saying, it's a long way to Tipperary. Mm -hmm. That's one image. That would be the sign. A sacrament would be it's a long way to Tipperary, and here's a wheelbarrow to help you with your load. Right. It's right. a silly story, but this is what we mean by modeled lesson of prayer. So this presentation of the lesson of prayer is the content, the duty, how you do it, what the content of this is, what are the petitions. And we find in Luke 11, he was casting out a devil. So as long as a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are undisturbed. The strong man with his goods is the man of prayer, the man, woman, a believer of prayer. And we see about the importunate widow in Luke 18. You can just see how many times Luke emphasizes prayer. Sure. The basic antiphon on this lesson of prayer is the last line. Jesus told him a parable about the need to pray continually and never lose heart. So if we want the world of sports, we must not get out of shape I'll be defeated psychologically before we, give, before we give up. I started late in life trying to play a little tennis just for exercise. And every once in a while I'd win the first set. And that always encouraged me that maybe, maybe I was getting better. Mm -hmm. But I never won the second or third. <laughs> <laughs> I realized it was also a game of stamina, which I no longer, which I no longer have. So this is the sure formula, this, as we find here in Luke 21, watch yourselves so your hearts will be coarsened. That day will be sprung on you suddenly. Stay awake, praying at all times for the strength to survive all that is going to happen. Stand with confidence before the Son of Man. That's a powerful lesson from Luke 21. The fact that God always hears our prayers is a central theme of Luke. Luke 1, 11 to 13. Luke 3, 21 following. Luke 9, 34, Acts of the Apostles 4.31, and many, many other times. The divine response is noted in a variety of ways. Sometimes the shaking of the earth, sometimes the opening of the heavens, and sometimes the appearance of angels. We don't get any of these, but remember, blessed are those who believe 
and have not seen. And that's where this all seems to come together. Luke does not seem to show any preference among these forms. They are all present and somewhat equally divided. Mm -hmm. The reason may be that Luke follows patterns in the presentation of what he's... We all don't know clearly what are the ultimate sources or the immediate sources of these right? You just can't imagine Luke walking down the highway of life 40 years after the events and sits down and writes this magnificent gospel. It came from somewhere. Sure. That doesn't seem he would have gone to the mythological library or that tremendously beautiful library of Alexandria that was burned with the approaching of the Rome What a loss. Just some indication of maybe the crudeness of humanity and the, witness, the wisdom of the centuries. So, there are, for many interpreters, prayer is what Luke had in mind, as he had it throughout his entire gospel. This is the way that we are going to win the battle. So, after this, one could spend even more time on both the theologies of martyrdom and prayer. Each of these is almost endless, rich study. For anyone who wants to continue, I can recommend a great book by a Protestant scholar that is Konzelman's Theology of Luke. But here we'll conclude our study of the agony in the garden and then take up the great mystery of the transfiguration which Peter witnessed. I see, Father. So um, the work you've done to help us understand the agony of the garden has definitely been rich and given me, for one, so much to think about. And before we say a prayer to conclude the reflection today, I'm looking forward to what we'll hear at the Transfiguration Study now. So can you give us a little taste of what's to come? Surely, uh, Lisa. The Transfiguration is covered by all four evangelists, by Peter, with whom we will begin, and by Paul, with whom we will end. Paul has page after page of the transfiguration and the need of conversion, whereas Peter sees it as transfiguring pardon. So we will look at these and then go into the theology of St. Thomas, theology of mediation, Christ as priest, Christ as king, and Christ as prophet. So it's a rather rich study and deep in theology. Ah, oh, wonderful. And I think, like the agony, the transfiguration comes up in our liturgies, but it doesn't get preached on very mm. much. So this will add a great deal to our understanding. Please, God will remedy that here. Well, that's wonderful. So, Father, will mm. you finish us with a prayer? Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Mary, Mother of the Church. Pray for us. St. Peter, please pray for us all. In the, In the name, name of the, the Father, Father, and the Son, Son and the Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. Amen. Well, thank you for teaching, Father. And God bless you, and thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed the program, and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.